science community and to try and facilitate the efficient use of the art of Archer resources. So, for example, by improving code performance or functionality. It's a not-for-profit service, so all money goes towards um, funding staff effort. Um, we are particularly keen on encouraging applications from new communities and throughout the whole process and we're aiming to encourage early career researchers to become involved. So just to give you a couple of examples, um, the things that might be funded through the ECSE programme. One is implementing algorithmic improvements into an existing code. Um, it doesn't fund the actual research to develop the algorithms, but it does fund the implementation of those algorithms. Things like improving the scalability and performance of the code, um, improving scalability and higher core count, that sort of thing is, is part of the remit. And general improvements to a code which will allow it to do science that couldn't be done previously. The funding does include the Xeon 5 system, so an example might be porting and optimising the code on that. Adding new functionality to existing codes, and also in terms of the Xeon 5 system, it also funds code development. Um, sorry, yeah, also funds code development um, for Xeon 5 systems and also for Tier 2 systems as well. But that's only for proposals that are Xeon 5 related. And the emphasis here is that it can't be fun, used to fund scientific research. So the funding funds um, established Archer communities. Uh, we have a number of proposals from existing communities and these are still encouraged. However, we're also keen to encourage people from new scientific communities, people that haven't used Archer before. The emphasis here is on new scientific areas, not specifically on new codes. The two often go hand in hand, it might be a new scientific area and a new code to Archer. Um, but you could also have a new code that's doing science that already exists on the system. So the emphasis is, is, is on a new scientific community. Um, the panel will look at any proposals that say that they're from a new community and make an assessment as to whether they believe that really is the case. Um, there's a ring-fenced amount of money for new communities. If, however, they believe that it isn't from a new community, it will simply be treated as a normal proposal. So we have three regular calls a year. Um, the current call that open, that's, there's a call that's currently open and it closes on the 31st of January. Now, there is an absolute limit of 12 months of funded effort on these calls. Um, the, that's slightly different from the duration of the project. The duration of the project could be slightly longer, for example, but the maximum amount of effort that would be funded is 12 months. And there's another two calls planned. Now, um, as we approach the end of the service, um, it has another year after, or it, it finishes near the end of 2018 at the moment. At the moment, we only have two more planned calls or confirmed calls. There may be an extra one, but uh, we don't have any confirmation of that. So what happens? So the call opens and um, if people request any guidance from us, for example, on how to, how to fill in particular sections, and um, we can provide that. And then once the call closes, the first thing that happens is they go out for a technical review. So they go to somebody who looks at whether um, what you plan to do is feasible, whether the codes can, you know, whether the performance of the code has been assessed enough to see whether the work could be carried out. We receive the responses from the technical review and we send out, we often send out a request for further information at this point. So the technical reviewer felt there was lacking information for the panel, they'll ask for that to be clarified. All this information then goes out to our panel, a panel of independent scientists who assess the proposals and um, agree a, a ranked 
agree, agree a list of projects to be funded and then we send out the results and the feedback. So after the call opens, you can submit your proposals via the SAFE system. Uh, I would advise, it's a relatively, if you don't have a SAFE account already, it's a relatively quick and simple process to do, but I wouldn't leave it till the very last minute before actually doing it, as well as the template form that you have to fill in. There is uh, an online form that asks for uh, details about all the applicants. So that takes a wee while. You can find out information and specific guidance on each of the sections at this address. And if you have any other questions, you can always contact us at the help desk. So you can request funding for um, staff members that are located at your own institution or from a different institution or indeed from a member of our centralised support team or some combination of the above. Uh, you, there's no limit uh, in terms of who can be a PI. It could be an early career researcher. You could be on a fixed term contract. Um, it's different. That's different from, for example, an EPSRC proposal. The only thing we might ask is if uh, you are on a fixed term contract that you're able to confirm that your um, university or institution is happy to host you um, throughout the duration of the project. The PI institution must be UK based and there's further details uh, in the guidance on this. But the co-eyes may be from elsewhere, they could be from anywhere really. And we often do have co-eyes that are based abroad, for example, but have particular expertise in the codes. One of the aspects that is assessed is the ability of your technical staff to do the work. So they'll look at the CV of the staff that you've proposed to do the work and try and assess whether they have the relevant skills to complete it. They'll also look though at whether, if you maybe feel there isn't the right level of skills, that do they have support from, for example, the PI and COI? So if the COI, for example, have, have strong experience in something. Also, training plans are part of the deal. Um, we are committed to funding an average of 14 full-time equivalents per year, so 14 FTEs, uh, 14 members of staff per year. Um, any money that's left over is being pushed back into the system, so we will end up funding more than 14 FTEs a year. And what we do is we use FEC costings. So you go through a very similar process to the process you would do for, say, an EPSRC or a NERC funding in your university. You specify the effort requested in person months. So yes, costs. What we pay 80% FEC, which is the same as the research councils. If you are requesting effort from an ARCH or CSE team member, um, then you don't need to specify the cost because they're already known. And we're also keen to see information on any existing funding that you may have. This is particularly relevant if the funding is related to the work you're doing. The panel will be looking to ensure that they're not being asked to double fund something, um, you know, or you know, to fund something that's already funded elsewhere. Every project is awarded a nominal amount of CPU hours. Um, this is for development work. There's no expectation that you should be using the time to do scientific work. So in exceptional circumstances, um, more time can be made available, um, but that will need justification. And it'll, uh, you'll need to explain why that's needed within the context of the ECSE. If you're looking to carry out scientific studies, that, that's not this is not the place to get CPU time for it. Um, you would need to um, apply to somewhere different, such as the RAP panel. I should also say that the CPU, a request for additional CPU time um, won't particularly influence the project, but you do need to, the outcome for the project, but you do need to justify any of those requests. 
Um, travel funding could be requested for any of the technical members for any of the technical members of staff, but it's not available for PIs and co-Is. So you can only request funding for the technical member staff on the project, and we only fund travel within the UK to meet the objectives of the project. So what that normally means is that we fund uh, meetings between partners. So for example, for the technical member of staff to, um, to travel uh, to, to meet one of the co-Is, for example. We also fund with um, relevant uh, travel to relevant training courses within reason. But it doesn't fund work such as travel to collaborative workshops or to conferences, anything like that. Again, the expectation is that's something that's driven by the scientific output, so would be funded through a science research grant. We usually fund one trip every three to four months. They're usually only for a day, potentially two days. Um, but we ask you to provide a breakdown of the travel costs and uh, to justify each trip. So if you feel it's necessary for more travel, then we would just ask you to, um, to explain why that's needed. Um, previous, pro previous projects and previous proposals. So if you've submitted a previous proposal, uh, maybe one that, uh, sorry, we're having a bit of an echo problem here. So when you actually submit, we do ask for details of any previous proposals that you might have had. Um, any previous ECSE projects. So we'll be looking again to see how things went on the, how you got on with previous ECSE projects. So as I mentioned before, there's this two-stage review process for all ECSE applications. There's the technical review and then the panel review. So what happens is, um, we do a, uh, an admin check on all the uh, submissions. So that is really just to check that all the relevant data is in place. Um, application, applicants are the, applications are then sent to our set of technical advisors. The majority of the technical advisors come from the Archer centralized CSE team. The only time they don't is if um, the applications involved anyone from the University of Edinburgh then they're obviously in the same institution as the Archer CSE team. So that's deemed a potential conflict of interest. And so they go to a group of external advisors. Now they're based in uh, institutions such as UCL, STFC, Leeds, various university or, universities around the country. And they're going to have, they also look to see if there's any missing technical information or detail that's required. We'll then send out a request for further information. Um, so there may be, for example, missing scaling data or missing just any form of missing information that we feel would be relevant for the panel. You'll be given an opportunity to provide that information um, and uh, you'll be able to submit that via the SAFE. All that information is sent to the panel. You can't at this point uh, change or modify the proposal, but you do get an opportunity to respond to the questions. In extreme cases, you can choose to withdraw or resubmit to a later panel um, at this stage. After that, all the information is sent to the panel members. So each application is independently reviewed by two panel members prior to the panel meeting, there's guidance and assessment criteria for the panel. Um, the meeting takes place around eight weeks after the call's closed. That, of course, is just simply about us being able to establish an appropriate date. And for each application, it is possible for the panel to decide to fund it in full, to decide not to fund it, or indeed to fund in part. It is very unusual for the panel to decide to fund something in part. Um, it may be, for example, that they felt that part of the proposal was out of scope. If that's the case, then you'll have the opportunity to decide whether to accept the partial funding or whether to um, resubmit the proposal. 
They can also choose to fund with requirements. So for example, proposed improvements to the project, although again, this is fairly rare. There is a robust conflict of interest and confidentiality processes, process in place. <clears throat> and if anyone has any questions about that, we'd be more than happy to answer them. We also, at each panel meeting now, have a small number of early career researchers um, who are present as observers. So these individuals have been selected through a competitive selection process. Um, we've actually just closed a call for new early career researchers that closed yesterday and they'll be assessed in the coming weeks. So how, is the, how are the proposals assessed? Well, we look at the track record of the applicants uh, with the aim of assessing whether the project, whether you've demonstrated that the project can be completed successfully so that the staff have the relevant skills, for example. We look at the new community's justification, and this needs to have enough information to justify that it is actually from a new community. We look, or the panel looks to assess the technical information provided uh, to ensure that it meets the relevant quality and standard. We look at the benefits, you know, why is this needed, what are the expected benefits. They look at what are the expected scientific benefits, there are also computational benefits, <clears throat> and also benefits to the Archer community. So this, this is a fairly important point, the benefits to the Archer community. One of the things the panel will look at is the availability of the software after the end of the project. They'll be looking to see whether there's any barriers to anyone using the software after, um, after the end of the ECSE project. So, for example, if you, you know, is it available to the entire community? Are there the restrictions? There's a pathway to impact. So again, the panel will assess the impact um, and the activities, uh, the proposed impact activities, to ensure any potential benefits are achieved. They'll also look at the work plan. They're looking to see that there's a good breakdown. Um, in terms of what's going to be done, and it, it looks sensible and gives confidence that the work can be completed within the time scale. If you've got multiple members of, of staff involved in the project, they'll also be looking to see that it's clear who is doing what in the work plan. And overall, they'll be assessing the quality uh, and objectives. Okay, so points to remember. Well, I mentioned the Archer community you know, an available availability of the code after the work is complete. But also this comes down to things like licensing arrangements. Um, it, there's no restriction on the type of licenses. It doesn't have to, for example, be open source. There's a number of codes that um, have been funded that, that have some form of commercial license. But the important point is we're looking to understand that there's not going to be a significant barrier for Archer users to use the results of, or to use the code after the end of the project. The objectives are important um, and where possible they should be measurable and quantifiable. The panel are looking to see <clears throat> that we can assess that the work has been achieved after it's complete. Um, and new communities, remember, be, you know, it may be a new code, but that doesn't automatically make it a new community. It really has to be from a new scientific area. Travel, keep in mind that we only fund the travel of the technical staff members and within the UK, we don't fund conferences. Um, and remember that the, the expertise of the staff, the proposed staff member is considered by the panel, it is part of the assessment process. <clears throat> they are looking to see that the people proposed for the work can actually deliver um, on the project. So the panel look for evidence that the work is achievable. So they are looking for scaling evidence. They're looking for performance data. They're looking to see that you understand that, that the changes you're going to make to the code <coughs> will have the required, will result in the required benefit. 
Um, and you can ask for help from the CSD team if you need. For a number of proposals, we've helped people to do profiling work on a code. But obviously, don't leave it till the day before the deadline. We do need a bit of time um, to organise someone to do this. And finally, we are looking to ensure that the work is not supposed to be carried out under a different project. <clears throat> so if you have funding in a related area, you know, please make sure that you identify why this is, is new funding or why you need new funding. So final decisions will be sent to the applicants, applicants together with the feedback from the panel around two weeks after the panel meeting. For unsuccessful applications, we'll try and provide as much constructive feedback as we can. And where appropriate and where the panel is keen, um, we will encourage people to contact the CSE team to gain further advice and support uh, in preparation for resubmission. So the times that that's happened is maybe we've had an application from an early, <clears throat> from a new community, um, and they've really lacked some of the important scaling data. Uh, and so the panel have asked us to, to try and help there. <clears throat> it is worth noting, though, that any resubmission will be treated in the same way as a new submission. It's a competitive process, and there'll be a new set of applications the second time round. So even if you manage to address all the comments coming back from the panel, it, that doesn't automatically mean that you will be funded the second time round. It's still competitive. So what happens if your project is accepted? We will start the process of setting up a contract. There's a fairly standard template, and um, there's usually a little bit of doing and with your institution um, over the exact wording, but um, normally that isn't a huge issue normally. And then we set up an Archer project, and we allocate your CPU time. You should gain a contact point, so somebody that you can that keeps in contact, someone to keep in contact with during the project. And um, you'll see when you do actually see the contract that some engagement with the Archer community is, is expected. In particular, we're looking for a final report. Um, if you want to see what the final report looks like, you can see it there. But also you'll be asked to give an Archer webinar. We showcase all the projects on the Archer website. Uh, there's a good resource if you go on to the ECSE program. There's a list of all um, well, there's a list of all the projects that have gone through review, final review from the panel. And from those, we create a subset of uh, larger case studies to showcase what's going on in Archer. <coughs> Excuse me. So in terms of KNL, the KNL system is relatively new. This is the second time it's been explicitly mentioned in the ECSE program. ECSE applicants can apply to develop on the KNL system. That's absolutely fine. And all the existing guidance basically applies. Uh, the same criteria and assessment procedures apply, whether it be for the normal Archer system or for the KNL system. But a couple of things to, to note. Um, the panel are advised that um, the technical members of staff may not have as much experience of KNL as they might do of the, the standard Archer system. Uh, this is just simply because it's a relatively new system and machine. So they may look at the wider package. So, for example, is there good support available from other people? Um, will they get good support from the PI and COI? Um, are there any proposed training courses they plan to go on? But overall, the, the same assessment will happen. The panel will assess whether they think the technical members of staff or the project as a whole has the expertise to complete the work. So as with other projects, uh, most normal well, uh, projects on the normal machine, um, all of the ECSE proposals uh, will be award projects will be awarded a small AU allegation. There are other mechanisms. And again, there's other mechanisms to gain a larger amount of time. If you're looking for time, this isn't the, the, the place to get it. The panel will assess the technical information in KNL proposals in exactly the same way as a standard Archer application. 
but the guidance um the guidance to the panel does make it clear that um, they should acknowledge that there'll be less scaling evidence and or previous results. But they will still be looking for you to demonstrate that the actual work is suitable and achievable um, within the time scale. Benefits to the Archer community. Now, the KNL system is part of the Archer system. So again, they'll be looking at availability of software at the end of the project and licensing, as I mentioned before. But for KNL, the term Archer community may still be of benefit, even if it's not directly on Archer. So this means for KNL proposals, your benefit may include things like the tier two systems, um, particularly when it involves closer integration between tier one and tier two. You can find out further information. There's a section on KNL in the, the standard guidance. If you have any questions in the meantime, uh, do send them in and we'll do our best to help. Okay, well, thank you very much. And we'll we'll sign off now. Thanks. Bye now.